All right, welcome to uh, the, I guess this is the third installment of our, our FASD uh, webinar series called Beyond FASD Screening. Um, and this webinar started, as many of you know, I mean, I see a lot of familiar names, uh, lots of people who have been on the previous webinars, but as many of you know, CAFC has a program to develop a toolkit uh, related uh, on with screening tools for FASD to be used in a number of settings. And we've done a number of webinars on those screening tools and a lot of research in KT around that. And we had a webinar series over the past couple of years introducing those tools and having a lot of discussion with the, the CAFC community and beyond the CAFC community on those tools. And as part of those discussions, we all inevitably had questions that went beyond uh, screening, questions about uh, diagnosis, about interventions, about all sorts of different aspects of FASD that were not directly related to screening alone, but people were obviously interested in. So with the uh, partnership of, uh, or with the help of CAFC's rehab community, the Canadian Network of Child and Youth Rehab, uh, we decided to do a webinar series to start to answer some of those questions that went beyond CAFC's work in screening. And we then went and decided to engage with uh, some of our partners who were really leading some of the work in this area, our partners at, uh, at NeuroDevNet. So that's where, more or less, where this, uh, this webinar has come from. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, this is the third part. The first episode was about diagnosis and core, core deficits of FASD. Uh, our second one was about interventions that make a difference in FASD. And now we have NeuroDevNet FASD research from the lab to the community. Um, so what uh, we have uh, today, who, who we have today with us, we have uh, Dr. Gail Andrew, who's going to be uh, uh, doing a bit of a welcome as well. Dr. Gail Andrews, uh, the co one of the co-chairs of, of CINSER, the Canadian Network of Child and Youth Rehab's uh, KT and Research Committee, uh, who's helping lead uh, the development of some of these webinars. Uh, but we also have with us from NeuroDevNet to really bring the, the, the information that, about NeuroDevNet um, to the, to the presentation. We have Dr. James Reynolds, who's the lead on, F on NeuroDevNet's FASD arm, uh, and he's at uh, Queen's University. We have Dr. Dan Goldwitz uh, from uh, out, out at University of British Columbia, who's also the scientific director of NeuroDevNet. We have Dr. Christian Beaulieu from uh, University of Alberta, and we have Dr. Joanne Weinberg also from University of British Columbia. Uh, so before we get started, uh, I'll just uh, mention, as most of you know, that we do not uh, unmute you to, to allow you to ask questions, so we require you to type the questions in. Uh, you should see a question box in your control panel. Usually it's on the right-hand side of your screen, I think is usually where it appears. Uh, so just type your questions in there, and I encourage you to type the questions in as you think of them. Uh, that way you don't forget them. Uh, and it also lets us uh, uh, see where in the presentation these questions are coming in so we can sort of better better target your answers and, and in particular which pre which presenter to uh, target the answers to. Um, now as I was introducing those four uh, presenters, we do have uh, two of our presenters have not arrived yet, at least not that I can see on my list, so uh, we may be introducing them. We're changing up the schedule a little bit. Uh, we were, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Weinberg and Dr. Goldwitz, but uh, they're missing in action, so we're going to go straight uh, to uh, Dr. James Reynolds after we have a brief welcome from uh, uh, Dr. Gail Andrews. So I'll just hand, at this time, I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Dr. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, I've had the pleasure of being the chairman of the Knowledge Translation Research Committee through the Canadian Network of Child Youth Rehabilitation for the past few years, and I've also had the opportunity to be one of the people on the FASD uh, project with NeuroDevNet, so I actually crossed both worlds. And I think this is really important because CINSER and NeuroDevNet have a lot of overlapping interests and populations that lead to this quite natural partnership. For those of you on the call who don't uh, remember what CINSER stands for, the Canadian Network of Child Youth Rehabilitation, it's uh, an organization of individuals across Canada whose interests are really and goals are improving the lives of children, youth, and their caregivers in Canada who have neurodevelopmental disabilities. And neurodevelopmental disabilities is defined broadly as both neuromotor and neurodevelopmental disabilities. And we look at engaging with researchers um, in a lot of our activities. Uh, some of the other activities of since are looking at uh, outcomes and ultimately bringing best and promising practices at all levels of service delivery, and then supporting a lot of our decision makers through knowledge translation in shaping what are the systems of care for um, our core populations. And when you look at the interests of, of NeuroDevNet, their core populations in their current uh, project are cerebral palsy, autism spectrum disorder, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. 
and NeuroDevNet's research questions specifically in FASD include the relationship between structural and functional alterations in the brain induced by the prenatal exposure to alcohol and the functional outcomes. But they're also really digging down at, at many levels uh, and some, some research questions around are there genetic and or epigenetic modifications that could be predictive of outcomes in children as a result of the prenatal exposure to alcohol. And then what are the uh, current state of the art of neuroimaging studies that demonstrate definite changes in the brain? And then looking within the lab of looking at our animal models where we can control different environmental factors, such as the amount of alcohol that's administered, the other compounding facts, factors such as stress and trauma or other teratogens in looking at uh, the outcomes within that animal model and then having a correlation with what we see in, in the human experience. So it's a very broad, broad group and really I think it's that whole life to lab and lab to life bi-directional flow of information. And I know with our knowledge translation component of sensor that's one of the things that we see we have a role in is having clinicians inform researchers about what are the current clinical questions and then providing a vehicle for that direct knowledge translation from research into informing clinical practice. So I'm very excited to have our very core members of the NeuroDevNet FASD team on board. So I think um, I'm not going to go through detailed introductions because they were provided in the printout of the advertisement for this webinar. So I think I'll turn it over at the present time to James Reynolds, who is the project lead for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in NeuroDevNet, to uh, bring on the, the first speaker. Okay. Um, sorry, was I supposed to just take over? <laughs> okay, here we go. Just while James uh, is getting ready, I'll just uh, let everyone know we always get the question about will these presentations be made available afterwards and in fact we do record all these sessions. Uh, so the full audio visual recording uh, will be available uh, through the CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network and you'll find that at, at ken.cafc.org. That's ken.cafc.org. So we'll preempt any of those questions about uh, information that might be available and if the presenters are able to share their presentations with us in PDF format we also post those if uh, if there's information sometimes uh, particularly in the research world there's unpublished data that sometimes gets uh, uh, shown on a presentation that they're not able to post afterwards but uh, if they are made available to us we will make them available to you okay uh, thanks very much Doug and, and thank you Gail for uh, for that introduction uh, what I'm, I plan to do today is uh, is really give you uh, an expanded overview of what has been going on in NeuroDevNet over the, the past three years uh, with respect to the, the FASD project. So what you're seeing now is the, the title of uh, the, the research program as it, as it was put together uh, a little over three years ago uh, when, uh, when we started. And we, we really went in with some very, very focused questions about the interactions between genes, uh, the genetic background of both the mother and the, the child, uh, interacting with environmental influences. And, and here we're primarily talking about uh, prenatal alcohol exposure. Uh, and could we, uh, could we explore and understand those relationships uh, in, in a much more informative way? We're also looking at uh, the possibility of, of identifying predictive biomarkers at, at both the biochemical and behavioral levels. Uh, and uh, as has been alluded to, as you'll see later in uh, in this presentation uh, from uh, from Christian, the, the relationship we're really uh, digging deep into the relationship between structural alterations in the brain and uh, the behavioral and cognitive outcomes that that occur in children. Uh, Sorry, Doug, a little technical glitch. My slides won't advance. Uh, if you just click on the, you sort of click to the go to meet the, the control panel app, just click on the screen on your presentation, and it'll bring that, that app, that application forward. So just click on your presentation in the middle of the screen. Okay. Yeah, just click anywhere in the middle. Yeah, and now, now it should move. There we go. Beautiful. Uh, 
So these were the research questions that we identified, and, uh, and Gail uh, alluded to these in her introduction. So uh, we're, we're scientists, so we have to have hypotheses and research questions to, to structure our, our work around. And these, these are the two that we came up with in original application. That is, what is the relationship between structural and functional alterations in the brain induced by prenatal alcohol exposure and functional outcomes in children? And secondly, are there genetic or epigenetic modifications that could be predictive of outcomes in children as a consequence of prenatal alcohol exposure? And here, uh, looking at, at these uh, genetic and, and epigenetic profiles in the kids and matching them with the, the phenotypes that occur, this is the first step, we believe, uh, uh, ultimately, in, in potentially identifying a diagnostic biomarker at the genetic level. Uh, so. These biomarkers might be used to confirm uh, prenatal alcohol exposure if there are characteristic uh, modifications of, of the genome caused by developmental exposure to alcohol. Uh, these could be very persistent and, uh, and available to us to, uh, to identify in postnatal life as a way of, of either confirming uh, prenatal alcohol exposure or, uh, this is again part of the research program, identifying those changes that would be predictive of the, for the kids who are going to have the, the largest number of problems. Who's going to develop uh, language and uh, cognitive and memory problems? Uh, and if we can identify those kids at much earlier ages, uh, be able to target them for the more uh, aggressive interventions that we know will have a long-term impact. So we're, there's a lot of people in the, on the FASD team. This, this is probably one of the more important slides that I'm, I'm going to show you. This really is a national effort uh, that is brought together for really the first time uh, leading scientists in both uh, uh, basic science studies using animal models to, to study the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure with clinicians uh, working in a coordinated way uh, across uh, these multiple projects. So bringing together information from basic and clinical studies that informs each other uh, and the value of the animal models uh, will become evident to you when you hear later from uh, Dr. Goldowitz and Dr. Weinberg about how we can control environments and therefore be much more confident that the outcomes that we're seeing in, in offspring are truly a consequence of alcohol exposure and not some, some other factor. So there's a, a wide range of expertise that's represented within the FASD team. Although I'm the project lead, uh, I'm what that really means is that, that I'm the head cheerleader for uh, a large group of, of very, very talented people who uh, bring their different perspectives to, uh, to this problem. A lot of clinical collaborators uh, uh, across the country who work with uh, kids with, with FASD, uh, and that's where we've, we've gone to recruit our, our uh, patient population, the, the kids and their, and their families who have worked with us over the last three years. And we have a lot of expertise also in, in understanding genetics uh, uh, and, and genetic processes. And these are not necessarily people who worked on, on FASD, but they bring that, their expertise or recruited their expertise into this, this clinical problem. So it's a very diverse, interdisciplinary group that has uh, built a, a tremendously impressive and uh, uh, very valuable research program over the last several years. So what have we done? Uh, on, the, on the clinical side, uh, we conducted a multi-site clinical study that collected behavioral imaging, genetic, and epigenetic information on a large group of children, uh, over uh, actually closer to 250, I believe. Uh, and these were both uh, typically developing healthy children uh, from the different regions of Canada that we worked in and children with uh, a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And these, uh, these, these data sets are going to drive uh, very, very important cross-platform analyses that will allow us to probe the relationship of FAC phenotype to brain structure and, and genetic profiles. But as I mentioned, in parallel with this, we've, we've done large-scale longitudinal studies in animal models such as uh, the rat that have generated really exciting new information um, that we're, we're going to be able to build on. And we're seeing some very, very uh, important parallels between the animal model study and, and the clinical studies uh, that we were, will, will build on for the future, and these will guide our, our next, the next set of research questions that we'll, we'll address. 
uh, and as you'll hear from uh, Dr. Goldowitz, some genetically diverse lines of mice are, are yielding new information regarding uh, genes that confer susceptibility to uh, ethanol-induced uh, brain damage. So I told you, uh, for those of you who were in the, the first uh, webinar um, back in December, about NeuroDevNet structure. We're interested in a developing brain. We, we study uh, a number of disorders, autism, cerebral palsy, and FASD uh, across a number of common platforms, animal models, genetics, imaging, but also a couple of, uh, of cores, neuroethics and neuroinformatics in particular, um, that uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing with, with them. So the goal is to generate, not just to generate knowledge, but to get it uh, out into the hands of uh, decision makers and, and stakeholder groups so that it can actually be used. So knowledge transfer, uh, knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization are important aspects of, of what we do. So we're very integrated across uh, across our, our network, uh, and you'll hear when you hear some of the, the science that's going to uh, to follow. Uh, and think about the parallels that have occurred. We have human genetics data that will uh, very much uh, parallel what's being collected in animal models, and those two projects, by using common tools uh, such as Neurocarta, which is an online database that allows us to search for genes associated with FASD outcomes. Um, these will be very, very powerful analyses that uh, up till now have not been possible. Uh, we'll compare all of these processes across human and rat models. Uh, one of the uh, very, very uh, uh, new areas that we'll uh, be exploring is the role of stress hormones uh, that in long-term outcomes, because this is one of the areas where we're seeing incredible parallels between the human and animal model studies. The neuroinformatics core is, is key to what we do. They're the people that help us build the databases to hold these, these very complex sets uh, of data, putting them together in, in, a, in a tool that's usable, allowing us to probe, uh, probe these data sets to find the relationships between uh, neuroimaging parameters and genetic profiles, for example, helping us to prioritize our lists of candidate genes that, that are important for uh, vulnerability to an FASD, and the more sophisticated bioinformatics approaches to that, to, that we need to take to data analysis to really make sense of uh, what we've generated. These databases are ultimately going to be a resource uh, that uh, we can see making available to other researchers uh, to, to probe and to ask questions about uh, what's the relationship between some of the parameters we've collected uh, in, in children across a broad age range who have FSD. Knowledge translation, our work with the KT cores has taken several uh, 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 several different approaches. One of them that we're really keen on is a program called the Strongest Families. Uh, this is uh, an inter internet-based intervention that is being developed to provide education and support for families across Canada uh, who are impacted by uh, FASD. This is in the development stage that uh, we hope to be rolling out into uh, clinical trials uh, later in the year. Uh, we've created a, a series, and we're creating more, a series of educational videos on FASD that are both to raise awareness and to convey specific messages to, uh, to different groups. Uh, for example, uh, the problems of kids with FASD in, in schools uh, and the best practices for, for dealing with, uh, with those issues. Uh, with the Neuroethics Corps, uh, we have engaged in a very important conversation about uh, the ethical considerations of identifying biomarkers of prenatal alcohol exposure. There's a lot of uh, dialogue that has to occur to really understand what is uh, uh, what are the implications of, of our discoveries. Uh, as I said many times, science science is racing ahead of our our appreciation and our understanding of what the ultimate impact is going to be. Finally, we have a number of joint initiatives between uh, our different uh, developmental disorder groups. Uh, for example, uh, developing a collaborative mission on sleep disturbances, which occur with such high frequency in children with neurodevelopmental disorders and are so, and are so poorly understood and, uh, uh, and we know have, have just a devastating consequence on, on brain development. So we're in the process of integrating analyses across all of these experimental platforms, imaging, genetics, and neurobehavioral phenotypes, as well as between the clinical and animal model studies. 
We're engaged in the evaluation and efficacy of intervention strategies, uh, taking several different approaches, developing new cross-cutting research themes to address common comorbidities in neurodevelopmental disorders, where I believe there's a, an incredible opportunity to learn more about our individual disorder of interest by looking for the commonalities and comparisons uh, across several disorders. And we're forming new national and international partnerships that will accelerate the pace of discovery and open up new research directions. It's by sharing information with other groups uh, uh, around the world who are also interested in these questions that uh, we'll really gain a common understanding and we'll be able to convey the, the, the new knowledge that we're generating that will influence FASD research and, and treatment in the future. And that's it. All right. Well, thank you, James. That was a great introduction to the overarching uh, NeuroDevNet. Um, we do have Joanne has joined the panel, uh, so I'm not sure what uh, if you want to change up the order or how you want to proceed, but James, I'll leave that up to you to make that decision. But while you're thinking about that, we did have a question, and this is an interesting question. I don't think this has come in in any of our FASD webinars. Uh, someone has asked, is there any research which shows risk factors uh, of paternal drinking with uh, FASD? There are uh, studies on risks of paternal drinking. Uh, it's, uh, we, have to, we have to be careful or distinguish between FASD and, and other consequences of alcohol exposure. Uh, the disorders that fall under the, under the umbrella of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are caused by maternal drinking during the pregnancy. However, uh, heavy paternal drinking, uh, heavy drinking by uh, males, does damage the DNA in sperm. And this can produce uh, adverse uh, outcomes in children. So there, there are, in fact, uh, cognitive and behavioral problems associated with uh, the uh, alcohol effects on the paternal genome as well. All right. Um, so uh, next up, uh should we uh, should we go over to Joanne? Uh, yes, I think we should. All right. I'll hand over Joanne. Can you? Uh, are you? Uh, is your audio working? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. Well, I'll just hand the screen over to you. Okay. Good. Okay, uh, uh, should I begin? Yep, you go ahead uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, thanks very much. I'm sorry I'm late. I had the time uh, confused. I thought it was 11 a.m. my time. <laughs> uh, so I apologize to the uh, listeners for being late. So our component of the NeuroDevNet project the NeuroDevNet project involves an animal model of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and I've listed on the screen the uh, other members of my laboratory who are involved uh, directly in this project, a research associate, Wendy Como, two graduate students, Parker and Tammy, uh, and of course, myself. How do I advance the slide, so? Uh, if you just click on the center of the slide, it should you should just be able to advance like you normally do, either click or use your right cursor key, or, yeah, there you go. Okay. So, um, just to reiterate, uh, I know you've heard about NeuroDevNet in previous uh, webinars, and uh, James has talked about it this morning, but we have two central questions driving all of the projects. One is to examine the relationship between structural and functional changes in the brain that occur with prenatal exposure to alcohol and the functional outcomes in the offspring. How do the brain and the functional changes we see correlate with each other? And secondly, trying to look for genetic or epigenetic signatures, epigenetic modifications that could be predictive of outcomes in the children. Uh, can this become a kind of new biomarker by which we can identify exposed children? And um, I, can, I can define epigenetics a bit later when I get to that if we, if we have time uh, for, for that component. So I think James has reviewed the clinical study 
It's a large uh, multi-site investigation with six FASD diagnostic clinics across Canada with a large cohort of children, both uh, alcohol exposed and typically developing, and a large battery of tests that have been administered to these uh, children looking at neurobehavioral outcomes, doing extensive neuroimaging, collecting tissue for genetic and epigenetic testing, and collecting saliva samples to measure cortisol, which is the major stress hormone. And again, uh, a focus has been to examine relationships among these measures. How do changes in the brain relate to cognitive outcomes, to neurobehavioral outcomes? Well, how do the stress hormones uh, relate to those outcomes as well? Do they play a role in underlying the sorts of outcomes we see? So our animal model has taken a very parallel approach. Uh, one of the strengths of our network and one of the strengths of the animal model is the ability to ask parallel questions and obtain parallel measures. And that strengthens outcome measures and strengthens our ability to look at mechanism and to understand outcomes uh, that we see with prenatal alcohol exposure. So we have a variety of advantages using an animal model. We can control for environmental variables in a way not possible uh, in the human studies, both the prenatal environment and the postnatal environment. We can control for genetics, which can be a big factor in how alcohol affects the, uh, the uh, offspring. Uh, we can look at contributions of stress by specifically um, titrating stress or introducing stress at different points in our study uh, to see how stress might contribute to developmental outcome, because certainly children with FASD often live in quite stressful environments or experience stress during their lives, even living in a good environment because of their uh, disabilities. Uh, we can, in parallel with the human studies, correlate behavioral alterations with changes in the brain, with changes in genetics, with changes uh, in, in epigenetic marks. <clears throat> And one of our other advantages is to be able to obtain measures for um, epigenetic analysis in the blood and the brain. Of course, in the children, we take samples peripherally, either from uh, a swab in the mouth, the buccal epithelium, or from saliva, um, or from blood. Uh, but in the animal model, we can look at directly at how those peripheral measures correlate with changes in the brain. And... Uh, that, that gives us a window as to um, how we can interpret those peripheral measures and where particular measures may be especially important. Um, and we can then take the brains and examine the brains directly. So let me talk a little bit about the model. This is our animal model, and I want to thank my graduate student, Kasia, for, for her uh, wonderful artistic abilities. So we have a group that is prenatally exposed to alcohol. Our pregnant female rats are put on, on an alcohol-containing diet throughout pregnancy. We have a control group uh, that gets a pelleted control diet throughout pregnancy. There are so-called normal animal comparisons. And we have a second control group uh, that controls for the fact that alcohol-consuming animals reduce their food intake. Uh, beyond what they would, uh, below what they would eat if they had the same diet without alcohol in it. And so we have a group that's matched to them or pair fed uh, to control for this reduced food intake. And then we examine the offspring at different stages of development. And this is an overview of our study design. Uh, we expose our animals to alcohol throughout gestation, from gestation day one to almost the end of pregnancy, gestation day 20. And then from weaning age on, which is around postnatal day 21, 22, we then test the animals or examine the animals at all phases of development uh, so that we have a complete picture of them as they grow up. We look at their social status there, whether they're dominant or subordinate animals, because we know that social status and socio socioeconomic uh, status can play a role in uh, behavioral and, and uh, brain development uh, in the human situation. So we have a proxy for that, and we look at uh, social status in the animal. 
We look at their activity and anxiety-like behavior early on in development. We look at social behavior. We can measure stress hormones, as we did in the, in the children, uh, pre and post, before and after introducing uh, stress during adolescence. And this is a specific stress regimen that we use. Uh, very controlled so that we can see during adolescence if they experience stress, what is their immediate response in terms of the stress hormones and how does that impact them later in life. And then we look at not only activity but a variety of cognitive tasks in adulthood and again test for their dominant status. And I'll talk a little bit about three of those behavioral outcomes uh, just to illustrate the kinds of data we have. And then at the end of our study, we terminate the animals, and we can then collect the brains and blood and livers uh, all through the course of development to look at hormones, to look at brain analysis, uh, brain development, changes in the brain, and genetic and epigenetic changes. So here's an example of our um, findings in regards to social behavior. We looked at animals that were PAE, prenatally alcohol exposed, uh, at, and tested them now at a young age during their juvenile period. And we found that they show less social interaction and less sociability than control animals. So this is our apparatus here. We have a three-chambered apparatus. The animal is placed in the center chamber. On one side, we have a, just an, an inanimate object. And on the other side, we have a ju another juvenile animal, a stranger that they've never seen before. And we measure how much time they spend in each of those chambers. And if you look at the graph on the left, the alcohol animals, PAE, are in red. Our other control group, pair for fed, are in green. And our normal controls are in blue. And you can see that the alcohol exposed animals show less social interaction. They spend less time with the social animal on the social side of the chamber and they spend much more time on the non-social side of the chamber. So a reduction in social behavior. And it's been thought in some cases that sociability, social behavior, can be kind of a marker for later life vulnerability to adverse outcomes, including mental health problems. Uh, so here we have a deficit in social behavior. Here's another one of our cognitive tasks. This is called a radial arm maze, and it tests working memory. So the animal is placed in the center of the maze, and we bait four of the arms with food, and that, that's indicated by an X here at the end of the arms. And the animal is free to explore and find food in each of those four arms. When, once he's finished, we take them out for a, an interval of time, five minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. The amount of time increases over testing. And then we put food in the alternative four arms. And the animal is placed back in the chamber, and they have to remember which arms they went to before and not go to those arms, which are now empty, but now go to the four newly baited arms. So it's working memory. They have to keep in mind uh, where they went previously and know where to go now. And this is what we show. The alcohol-exposed animals take more days to reach the, the performance criterion. This is with a five-minute uh, delay. Oops, sorry. This is with a five-minute delay between trials. And you can see the PAE animals, the alcohol-exposed animals shown in the red bars, take more days to reach criterion than the two control groups. Interestingly, once they learn the task, once they learn the task, they perform it pretty well. So here's the next set of, uh, the next set of trials. And we have our control, our parafed control, and the alcohol-exposed animals. And we make the task harder. Now, instead of a five-minute delay, we have a 20-minute delay. And they're just fine. Once they've learned it, they perform perfectly well. So they're not, uh, they have learning or performance deficits, but not that severe. But then, if we challenge them even further, if we introduce a social partner into their cage during the delay while they're waiting for the next trial, they are more distractible. And if they have social interaction in the interval between trials, then their performance disintegrates, deteriorates, and they, take, uh, they make more errors on this task than they did 
without the, the distractor in between trials. So again, very parallel to the kinds of uh, attention problems and distractibility problems that we see in children with prenatal alcohol exposure. Here's another test of working memory, a very simple little tea maze. The animal is placed at the start. We place food on one side. The animal has to go and find the food. We take them out for an interval again, put them back at the start, and now they have to go to the opposite side. So they, again, working memory. They have to remember that they turned left the first time. Now they have to turn right in order to get the food. Here we had a very interesting finding. And our finding in this task was that their social status early in life influenced their performance in a way that did not occur for the control animals. And this is what we saw. On the left, we have our control in blue, pear fed in green, and the alcohol exposed in red. If they were dominant, if they had high social rank or high social status when they were in the litter, their performance on this team maze is very good. However, if they were subordinate, if they had low social status in the litter, then they make more mistakes on the task than the two control groups. So this, in a very interesting way, links their early life status to later life cognitive uh, performance. Um, and uh, and uh, shows a relationship that we don't see in the control animals how early environmental variables, early social influences can affect performance. I'll show one more example, and this is a little more complicated graph, but I'm going to walk through it. We then looked at whether we can correlate our stress hormone levels with errors that they make. How do their measures, how do their stress hormone levels relate to their cognitive performance on these complicated tasks? And this is uh, an example of the T maze. And we found that the, the stress hormone levels correlate uh, with uh, social status. Uh, stress hormone levels depends on social status for the alcohol exposed, but not for the control animals. And that is, the higher the stress hormone levels, the more errors they make. So here we looked at post-pubital corticosterone levels, stress hormone levels, that's the hormone in the rat that is the stress hormone, and we correlated that with number of errors. And we looked at their status in the litter and their status in adulthood. How do all of those things link together? So let's look first at this right-hand side of the graph. We have litter status, they were subordinate, and in adulthood they were either dominant or subordinate. And we found animals that were subordinate in their litter and remained subordinate in adulthood showed this very nice correlation between hormone levels and errors. The higher the stress hormone levels, the more errors they made. Interestingly, interestingly we saw that same uh, correlation if they were dominant in the litter and dominant in adulthood. For the alcohol exposed, but not for any of the other groups, there was a correlation with higher stress hormone levels indicating more errors. And at first we were a little surprised to see that, but maintaining dominance status is quite stressful. The animal constantly has to be vigilant uh, and try to maintain its status. So if you're subordinate and a low social rank, that has its own stressors and seems to affect cognitive performance later on. And if you're dominant and trying to maintain dominance for the alcohol animals, but not for the controls, that's also stressful. So interesting relationships between stress hormone levels, social status, and cognitive performance. And I'm going to show, and, and I want to point out that these are all very preliminary findings. We're just at the start of really delving into this wealth of data that we have. Um, but I'll show you very preliminary analysis from the clinical study, which also measured salivary cortisol and also correlated cortisol with neurobehavioral outcome. And a very preliminary first pass suggests that for the children that are prenatally alcohol exposed, but not for the controls, we found a correlation of their morning basal stress hormone levels with a variety of adverse outcomes higher morning cortisol levels 
was correlated with sensation seeking, with more problems at school, related to the number of different placements they had had, related to a history of neglect, adverse home environment, uh, negative adverse behavior, um, trouble with the law. It seems that the stress hormone levels really might be a marker that correlates with later life outcomes. An adverse uh, early life insult like alcohol exposure coupled with adverse environmental events may be indexed in cortisol and that may be a marker or relate to the kind of neurobehavioral outcome we see. So I'm going to actually skip the epigenetic uh, uh, findings quickly and just go to uh, the end because I think my time is, is up. So what can we take from this research to date? We see from the animal models, and now very powerfully uh, in our preliminary analysis of the human data, that there is the potential for early life social and environmental factors to possibly be used as markers to predict vulnerability or resilience in individuals with FASD. And I think this is, in some ways, a, um, a finding that people have thought about previously, that have had people have had in mind previously. But it's fairly powerful when these types of relationships come out, not just in the human data, but in an animal model uh, where, where we see these links. Uh, cognitive deficits are related to these early life social and environmental factors, and that suggests changes in the brain that persist into adulthood. And we are analyzing brains for, to see what changes we have, and we're looking at brains to see whether there are changes in gene expression genes turned on or off differently in the alcohol-exposed animals compared to the controls. Stress hormone levels can play an important role in brain development and may influence outcomes later in life, and uh, changes in gene expression may be one of the mediating factors in behavioral and neurobiological outcomes observed. That's the end of uh, my presentation, and this is just um, an slide for my wonderful uh, team of, of students and uh, associates with their uh, significant others in this uh, picture at our uh, holiday party, and uh, thanks for the funding that we've received that supports this work. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Joanne. That was a great presentation. Um, we do have uh, Dan, I believe, is out there, so uh, we do have, and we have a few questions. So while we're asking these questions, we will... Uh, uh, we'll try and get Dan online as well. So I assume uh, for the t for the presenting team that we will go with Dan and then Christian will follow. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, so we uh, we had we do have a couple questions. It's uh, one of the questions was asked early on when you were describing the uh, the the, um, the model of alcohol exposure, uh, and he's asking in this model what is the level of ethanol intake? For example, is this equivalent to binge? What is is, is it equivalent to binge-type drinking or long, okay. steady exposure? Right, that's a very good question. I should have mentioned that. Uh, it's not a binge model. Our animals get alcohol all throughout gestation. Uh, they can drink voluntarily. It's free access throughout gestation. And our mark for how much they drink is blood alcohol levels. And the blood alcohol levels in this model are around 150, 170 milligrams per deciliter or milligrams per cent. So in uh, that's uh, two or three times the level for drunk driving, depending on the jurisdiction where you live. Uh, and that's kind of a steady level throughout gestation. So it's not the extremely high levels that you would find with binge drinking. It's not the extremely high levels you would find with full fetal alcohol syndrome but it is a reasonably high level of alcohol exposure. And although the animals physically look normal, functionally and behaviorally, clearly they have deficits. All right, thank you. Um, someone also asked, you had on the slides, uh, CMS and uh, non-CMS. Can you just explain what the acronym CMS stands for? Yes, sorry. Um, I, I skipped over that because didn't have differences with stress, but CMS stands for chronic mild stress. Oh. And that was the stress we had introduced during adolescence, uh, a period of 10 days during adolescence. Animals were exposed to 
uh, 10 different stressors twice a day for an hour or so at each exposure. And it's meant to simulate a sort of chronic, mild, unpredictable stress that was concentrated during the period of adolescence. And for the outcome measures I showed, there was no real difference between those exposed to stress, chronic, mild stress, CMS, and those that were in the non-stress group, uh, stress didn't have a differential effect. It did have a differential effect on some of our other measures, but I didn't show those today. Uh, thank you for that. I should have uh, defined that. Um, and when you were talking about the inanimate distractor, is that similar to a social distractor? Um, in the, is this during the social uh, behavior test? I believe that was when you were talking about the mazes and you added an inan inanimate distractor. I think he's asking, is that sort of trying to simulate a, a social distraction? No, we added an actual social distractor. I'm sorry if I used the word inanimate there. We had an inanimate object in our three-chamber test in testing social behavior early on. But in the maze test, during the interval when they were waiting for the next trial, we put a, a strange young animal into the cage with them. It was a true social distractor. Okay. And once we introduced a distractor, a social distractor like that, that's when their behavior, uh, that's when their performance uh, got worse. Okay. All right. Um, and someone also, uh, the next question is, um, when you started talking about the stress hormones, she's asking, are you saying that the fetal alcohol exposed brain creates more stress hormones or is it directly related to social influence? Well, that's a really good question because as I said, these children have a lot of uh, adverse experiences early on as well. But we, what we think is that the alcohol exposure itself during the prenatal period changes the, the sensitivity of the stress system. So it's not the brain that's producing the stress hormones. The stress hormones are produced uh, in a small gland called the adrenal gland, uh, but they can circulate and affect uh, body tissue, and they can affect the brain. They can cross and affect the brain. So what we think happens is that prenatal exposure to alcohol changes the sensitivity and responsiveness of the stress system so that the stress hormones are produced in higher amounts, uh, for children prenatally exposed to alcohol than for controls. We see it in our animal model, and we actually see it in, a, we've seen it in a number of studies in the, with uh, um, children where the stress hormone levels are, are higher in children prenatally exposed to alcohol. Uh, and this was a bit of a clarification on the, the effect of the higher stress horm or the higher stress. Uh, she's asking, does higher stress in the morning results, or sorry, she's asking, she's saying, is higher stress in the morning results in behavioral problems outcomes later in the day or later in life? Uh, no, uh, sorry, I, I may have not said that clearly. We measured their resting hormone levels in the morning, and it turns out that those who had slightly higher resting hormone levels were the ones who had more adverse behavioral outcomes. So the, the change in the morning hormone levels is re reflects change in their stress system in general that was caused by alcohol prenatally. Their stress systems are now differentially responsive, differentially sensitive because of the prenatal exposure. We measure the hormones early in the morning when they wake up. Those are kind of resting hormone levels. But the, the, the levels of those hormones correlate then with adverse neurobehavioral outcomes in these children in general. So it's sort of a, a change in their resting state that we're, that we're measuring by measuring hormone levels in the morning. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for that clarification. Now, we did have uh, Dr. Dan Goldwitz for a brief moment, and he has unfortunately had to leave us again. He did mention to me in a message, uh, James, that he sent you a presentation if you're able or willing to present the material. I'm not sure if you're prepared to do that. But. Uh, uh, I didn't know he had done that. <laughs> uh, Surprise! <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, so why don't we uh, move to Christian then? Okay. All right. Sounds good. And just, there's just one last question. Give me a chance.
Sure, yeah, that'll give you a chance to at least have a glance at what he's looking at. Um, Dan's been, uh, he's actually in Ottawa right now, meeting with our colleagues at the Public Health Agency of Canada and a number of other uh, organizations in, uh, in the nation's capital here. So, uh, so he's unfortunately been uh, delayed at one meeting and the other me and has to go to his next meeting. So he was trying to fit this presentation in between, but uh, unfortunately he's not able to, it didn't, the schedules didn't work out. Um, but we're going to be handing over to uh, Dr. Christian Beaulieu in a second. Um, so we'll just get the screen over to him. Uh, and we did have one more question before we go on to that. Uh, and again, as always, if, if I've, if I've paraphrased uh, your question incorrectly or if, or if the answer that you that has been given isn't exactly answering the question you're asking, don't hesitate to put in a follow-up into a uh, comment or question into the um, into the question box so I can see that and we can sort of add it to the discussion. Uh, but someone is asking here, uh, have there been studies with children with FASD uh, being tested with strange situation experiment? Now, I'm not familiar with the strange situation experiment, but perhaps that means something to you. Uh, is that a question for me? Uh, for uh, it, uh, it could be for you or anyone else on the panel who uh, might be familiar with this. Why don't we start with you, Joanne? Uh, I might be able to help. It's Gail here. Okay, good. Thanks, Gail. Now, the uh, strange situation is useful in looking at the type of attachment that a particular child has developed with their significant caregiver. And it's, uh, it's a paradigm that's been uh, really well researched where... Um, a child and their caregiver are together, and then the caregiver leaves, a stranger is there, and then there's a reunification. That's just a very brief description. And it's used predominantly when we have a child that we feel has a, a disordered attachment. So it's not necessarily um, a child who's being prenatal exposed to alcohol, although they're uh, within that population of children who have the disordered attachment. I think prenatal alcohol exposure is perhaps one of the there are multiple risk factors. There hasn't been a detailed study of children with prenatal exposure to alcohol, but that is another good research question that we can perhaps throw out to our, our the clinical side of our team. All right. And is that a question we're throwing out right now, or 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 is this a, you're suggesting a, a research question going forward? I think that's a research. Okay. Going forward. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were actually looking for a response from uh, our clinical, uh, the folks presenting here on the clinical side of things. Um, and just one more last uh, question. Yeah, one, one more last question before we go on to uh, Dr. Bolia. Uh, is She's asking, could the adrenal gland be affected to the extent that it, that it is automatically creating more stress hormones? And this would be for Joanne, I think. Um. Yes, we're not exactly sure what, what the change is. We know that um, the system is in general more responsive to stress. Uh, whether the resting levels are also significantly higher remains to be determined. So it's not that the, it's not that the hormones are just constantly being produced no matter what. It's more that the system is more responsive when they encounter a stressful event or a stressful situation. But, but we, we think that in that case, then every time they're exposed to stress, there's a bit more of a response than you might see in a child that was not exposed to alcohol. And an accumulation of that kind of uh, increased response or increased stress hormone levels repeatedly over the lifespan could have some negative consequences on health. So that's more how we view it, that it's more the system is in general, a bit more responsive to stressors. It's not that the hormones are being pumped out all the time at a high level. All right, well, thank you. And that's all the questions we have for now. So we'll move on to the next uh, section of the uh, presentation. So over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I've been part of the uh, NeuroDevNet uh, FASD team. And um, what my role is to coordinate the uh, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI study of the brain uh, aspect of the FASD subproject, and that's what I want to talk to you today about. Um, and what I'd like to do is uh, give a bit of a background about uh, what we hope to study uh, and what, why we feel MRI might be useful, 
And then go into uh, talking about the actual NeuroDevNet FASD MRI project and some just some initial preliminary results uh, from the Edmonton cohort. As you'll see, this is a multi-site uh, study. And then just talk uh, very, very briefly uh, about some future directions. So I'm sure we have a very wide audience out there. And so the brain basically consists of, you know, from a biomedical engineer's perspective, of uh, little computers or CPUs and, and brain wiring. And uh, here on the right, we have a, a cross-section of an actual human brain where you can see the exterior part is the cortex, uh, which is the CPUs, and the internal white part here is the wiring or the connections. And the, what, what, there are two important aspects to how the brain functions. One, you obviously need your computers to be working properly. Uh, and then secondly, they need to actually communicate with each other in order to uh, be able to do the complex things that we are all able to do uh, because one brain region doesn't do it all. They need to communicate in sync and they need to communicate efficiently and quickly. And these, uh, you'll see that we have different MRI techniques for trying to understand if something's up with the computers or the deep relay stations, uh, which is the deep gray matter or the cortex, and then also the white matter or the wiring. And if you look at a, another uh, actual pictures of the human brain, you can see some of this brain wiring quite nicely right here. Uh, look, they kind of look like these spaghetti noodles uh, here going towards the cortex. And we have methods to be able to measure this non-invasively uh, without obviously taking the brain out, which is not a optimal situation for most healthy volunteers. <laughs> Now, what we'd like to be able to do is take pictures of the brain and make measurements of it. And one way of doing that, as most people would, might know, is the use of MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. And here's a picture of kind of a latest state-of-the-art MRI scanner here, where the person would lay on this patient bed and the head would go inside and we would end up taking pictures. And it uses a big, strong magnetic field. And the thing that's important to re remember is that MRIs are a picture of water. And so, luckily for us, tissue is about 70 to 80 percent water, and that includes your brain. We take pictures of water, and water behaves differently in diseased parts of the brain versus healthy parts of the brain. And that's what we're going to use to be able to try to make measurements uh, to tell whether the brain is different in one individual than another. Now, we're interested in the prenatal alcohol effects on the brain, and we know that there's a lot of deficits that are involved uh, with these children, but not all children with prenatal alcohol exposure have all of these deficits as well. Now, in most cases, standard MRI or you know clinical MRI as you would get in a radiology clinic is not usually done, but when it is done, um, it can show smaller brain or corpus callosum or cerebellum. However, we feel that these findings probably are, are underestimating the extent of injury uh, by standard MRI, and that's because of two things. One is standard MRI is really geared at looking at lesions or specific uh, locations of injury, um, and not and it, it's not quantitative. You, you're not able to measure uh, how big or small something is, uh, and it may be that subtle changes of, of volume or connectivity may be causing a lot of the uh, disorders that we have listed up above here. Now. I'm just going to show you a couple of slices of the brain. Here are some MRI scans of, of different slices of the brain in two kids, two 12-year-olds. These upper two slices are from one child, and the bottom two slices are from another child. And my question to the audience is, can you tell which child has an, an FASD and cognitive difficulties, and which child is a control and does not have any uh, cognitive difficulties? I'll give you a moment to look at them. And the easy answer is that it's really difficult to tell. And there's really nothing that distinguishes uh, these two images from one another. In fact, the top one is a 12-year-old male control with an IQ of 130. 100 would be average. And as at the 98th percentile for reading, so an excellent reader. And then the bottom images are from an FASD subject who has an IQ of 74 and is in the first percentile for reading, has great difficulty in reading. Okay. Now, these images look pretty much the same, uh, yet we know that their performance is not. 
And that highlights a very important aspect that what we have to do to use MRI effectively is to do quantitative MRI. And that means measuring stuff. That's what scientists do. We like to measure things, come up with numbers, and then compare them. And two things that we can compare are volumes. So here on the left, we have gray matter volume. We can measure white matter volume here. You can measure deep gray matter volumes. And we can also measure connectivity of different brain regions. This track here connects Broca's and Wernicke's areas for language. These are the cortical spinal tracts important for motor. All right, so we can measure these things non-invasively using MRI in children. And some of our previous results prior to getting involved, uh, prior to uh, NeuroDevNet, um, which was also funded by Networks of Centers of Excellence and the CIHR, which is our Canadian funding agency, is we saw that there were abnormalities in FASD in the white matter tracts that were in connectivity, were indicated by these red and blue uh, symbols. We saw that they were, there were volume differences where the brain, whole brain was about 8% smaller in FASD than control subjects. And in some regions, like the basal ganglia, uh, we saw as high as 18% drops in volume. So quite large changes in volumetrics in FASD. And if you look at the thickness of the cortex, remember that's that outer layer, these areas that are shown in green and blue were areas that are thinner in FASD than in control subjects that were matched for age and gender. Right? So this indicated to us that indeed there are a lot of differences in the FASD brain, in the white matter, in the deep gray matter, in volume, and in the cortex. Um, but these were all small sample sizes of 30-odd subjects. And the real advantage, as you'll see, for NeuroDevNet is the ability to get uh, much larger sample sizes and really try to start to tease out uh, relationships with cognitive uh, ability in much larger populations. So what are some intuitive interpretations of volumes and connectivity? Well, I'm from Alberta, Great White North, so we have a lot of pickup trucks. Uh, you can think of volume as the, you know, the amount of horsepower you have under the hood. And, uh, you know, one is okay, but maybe more horsepower is better. The connectivity, uh, you want all those connections between the brain regions to be nicely organized and efficient. And if wires are frayed and you have uh, very poor connections, that may impact one's cognitive ability. So... What are we trying to do with NeuroDevNet, and how are we going beyond what's been done before? Well, we're doing this comprehensive brain MRI exam, which I've got listed here at the bottom, and we're looking at volumes and brain connectivity and cortical thickness, as I've mentioned before. We're also looking at resting state brain function, which I'm not going to talk about uh, today. But importantly, what we're also doing is things like eye tracking, which is a window to the brain, because we can't obviously give an MRI exam to every uh, child. It's expensive. It's not always available. Um, but if something's cheaper alternatives like eye tracking can provide windows into the brain, uh, then we may have a tool that's much more uh, extensively used. We have genetic susceptibility, which we didn't have uh, any of this genetics information in our previous samples. And then we have extensive cognitive batteries and behavioral batteries. You know, and the goal is to try to compare all of this upper part to what the actual status of the brain is here below. Now, for those of us that are, of you that are visiting us from uh, outside of Canada, um, this is a multi-site imaging study that takes place in four sites across Canada. We have University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, we have the uh, um, University of Manitoba here in Winnipeg, and we have uh, Queen's University here in Kingston, and we recruited children across all these four sites. And we got an MRI on 93 control subjects and 89 FASD children across these four sites. So really a, a huge wealth of data, uh, given that the largest published studies on MRI on FASD uh, have a maximum of around 60 or so currently subjects with FASD. I'm just going to present to you some preliminary data just from my site at the University of Alberta, which is way up here, and um, where we had 33 fetal alcohol subjects ages 5 to 19 years with 17 females, and we compared their brains and MRI scans uh, to 44 controls with the same age range and 23 females. And 
Uh, what we found, first off, is if we look at brain volume, where the blue bar here is the controls and the white bar is the FASD, we saw about 7% drop in total brain volume uh, in the FASD subjects, in agreement with our earlier work. Um, remember, this is just the Edmondson data. And this was due to reductions in both the gray matter and the white matter. If we looked at the cortex, what you see here at the top are surface renderings of the brain, and the color represents the thickness of the cortex. Okay, So red is a thicker cortex, so you can see this region here, and green and light blue are thinner cortex. So you can see that the brain does have variations in thickness just in healthy controls, and that's normal. If you look at FASD subjects, uh, you can see the very similar pattern. The parts that are supposed to be thicker, uh, like here, are thicker, and parts that are supposed to be thinner are thinner indeed. So the overall pattern is very, very similar to controls. However, if you look carefully, you can see that some areas here, like our dark blue in the FASD subjects, are, look, appear to be thinner than in the control subjects. Same with here. You see a lot yellow at the top here where it's red up here. Okay. If you do statistics on your two groups, um, then what you notice is the areas that are green and blue here below are the areas that are significantly thinner in FASD than controls for the cortex. And you can see that there's a, a lot of areas in the kind of the motor, supplementary motor areas. We have some scattered areas in the visual cortex, and we have some areas in the temporal lobe as well as the frontal lobe. Okay? These areas aren't as extensive as our earlier work, but I caution that these are just preliminary results right now, and the goal is obviously to combine all of the subjects from the different sites and really get a handle in a much larger group. The future directions, as I mentioned, is we hope to combine the data from all four sites. We have 182 subjects in total that we need to look at, and the goals are threefold is one, can quantitative MRI techniques identify the brain regions that are affected in individuals that have been diagnosed with an FASD? And then, of course, one of the goals is to start to decipher whether there are differences in brain changes depending on the diagnostic category. Uh, secondly, are there structural brain differences that underlie individual performance? Can we correlate changes in the brain with in certain regions of the brain with certain aspects of performance, and that includes things such as uh, uh, math ability, reading, et cetera. And how is the status of the brain related to the underlying genetics and diagnosis? And this is going to be a very interesting avenue that's not been explored before. Finally, just to finish up, uh, obviously uh, we can't do research without the children and the parents and the caregivers who give up their time and agree to be involved in research and, and for the kids to go into the MRI scanner and have their brain scanned. Um, also, my trainees for analyzing the MRI data that I've shown you today. And then our, uh, this type of work requires a big collaborative team uh, in order to identify the FASD subjects. And uh, our moderator, Gail Andrew, uh, a lot of the children that I've mentioned today came from her clinic. Uh, James, who has uh, uh, really driven this entire project from start to finish and Dr. Evans at McGill for providing the cortical thickness software, and of course, NeuroDevNet, which is one of the networks and centers of excellence for providing the funding as these studies are very expensive. Um, and so I hope I've convinced you that uh, MRI can provide you more than just uh, pretty pictures, but hopefully can provide some insight into FASD. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, well, that was some great, uh, great presentation with a lot of great, great pictures there. Um, so just uh, before we go on to, uh, well, are there any questions? We don't, haven't had any questions specific to that presentation, but while we're uh, if we, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, we did have a comment that that was fantastic. So uh, we did don't we did know that uh, people were listening, in fact, and I can attest, I, I can agree with at least one thing that you presented that I did live in in Edmonton for a while, and they do have a lot of pickup trucks there. But uh, while we're uh, waiting for any questions. Um, James, I did receive the presentation from Dan, uh, but it is apparently too big for you to receive, I guess. So I'm not sure what you want to uh, do with that, whether you want me to flip through the slides or if you want to just skip that piece. But. Uh, well, how are we doing for time? Uh, well, we have scheduled until 1230.
Um, and I don't, and we've already answered, it seems like uh, we've answered most of the questions. So I, I don't know if there'll be too, depending on how many questions there might be related to, uh, to Dan's work. Well, if, if you could run the slides from there, I'll, I'll uh, wing it on as far as the presentation goes. All right, sounds good. Then I'll, uh, I'll put it up. Uh, can you hear me? I, I can help if you'd like. If there's, uh, if we go through Dan's presentation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we can certainly hear you for sure. And uh, so you should. Uh, here we go. So we did have a question come in uh, for Christian before we move on. Um, uh, the question is: Do you see in the future a diagnostic tool that would not be as costly as MRI? Well, um, you know, the question of diagnosis is, is a tricky thing. I mean, even in MRI, one of the goals that we had going into the project is that we would be able to put somebody in with a suspected FASD and uh, find a, a signature, if you will, an MRI signature that would, you know, pin down that if you have this and this and this and that, that, uh, that it's consistent with an FASD and not with some other uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disorder. Um, and the uh, problem so far has been that the human brain is quite a variable thing and, and individuals of the same age, even control subjects, have quite a uh, variety in the thickness of the cortex, in the white matter connectivity, in, the, in brain volume for that matter. And so I think um, even with something like MRI, it's been a challenge to find some type of diagnostic test. Um, in terms of other types of tests for imaging the brain, uh, there aren't a lot of other really uh, cheaper options, if you will. Um, CAT scanning uh, obviously is, is no cheaper and, and has x-rays, which isn't going to be appropriate. Um, ultrasound isn't a really great way of looking at the uh, adult brain, maybe the field brain, but not the adult brain. Um, but the hope is that maybe some of these other measures like the eye tracking and uh, things that can you can bring to the bench may give you a window into the brain, but they're not going to be measuring obviously the brain itself. So the hope is that we may be able to find uh, markers that do link with consistent findings in the brain and use those. Um, but at the end, there, there's really no substitute for looking at the brain itself. All right. And is, is there an eye tracking assessment? Uh, yes, and James maybe can respond to that. Yes, so we, that's what I've been working on in, uh, in my lab is the use of uh, eye movement behaviors and eye movement control as a way of assessing brain function. As, as Christian uh, uh, mentioned, the eyes really are a window into the brain because uh, we, know, we know so much about how uh, eye movement control is regulated by different brain structures that uh, problems with eye movement control uh, are, are really predictive of uh, areas of the brain that have been affected. And uh, we're working on a couple of, of techniques uh, that uh, allow us to model the behavior of uh, children looking at uh, very natural scenes. Uh, and uh, we're, we're able to differentiate uh, kids with FASD from control kids with, uh, with fairly high accuracy. Uh, so we're continuing to, you know, to develop these approaches and now looking at comparing them, uh, comparing the same uh, techniques across other developmental disorders uh, to ask the question about specificity. All right. So what would, uh, just one more question, what would it take to get that MRI signature much larger N or is general population variability really the problem? Is this vari variability as prominent in younger kids, for example, toddlers? Uh, well, we, we've not scanned anyone um, below the age of five um, for practical reasons. <laughs> uh, trying to keep a three-year-old still in an MRI scanner for 22 minutes would probably next, be next to impossible. Um, but uh, I, the reality is that it, I think looking at just one, one of, you know, what I presented was here's what cortical thickness shows, here's what volume shows, and here's what diffusion or, or uh, white matter connectivity shows. Um, looking at these things separately, uh, give you clues that there are group differences between the FASD and, and control subjects. 
Um, but the reality is that uh, we probably need a mix of all those measures. Uh, and further, there's just so much variability even in the um, FASD cohort itself that, uh, that uh, you know, depending on when the injury occurred and, and other things that happen during the lifespan, um, that it's going to be very, very challenging to say th these are the exact specifics for what a brain should be at this particular age in this gender. And I think that's going to be the, the, the challenge for finding a signature is just um, we know that the, uh, the brain changes as a function of age and uh, not all the brains develop at the same age, uh, at the same rate, even in healthy subjects that have no clinical disorders. So trying to tie even just healthy development down is, is a challenge, let alone throwing um, the uh, uh, FASD on top of that. But at the end of the day, that's really the goal of the current project. And with the sample of near 200 subjects, uh, hopefully we'll make some inroads into determining uh, that relationship. Right. Right. So there's one last comment that came in. Was this, So this is definitely, at, at this point, a research tool as opposed to a diagnostic tool. Yes, indeed. Yeah. All right, James, are you uh, ready to go with this presentation that's not yours? Uh, absolutely. Surprised <laughs> all of us. All right. <laughs> uh, so here's the, just okay. let me know, let me know when you want me to advance and we'll. Sure. So um, why don't you advance to the next one? I'll see you with, uh, what's under door number one. <laughs> right. So this, uh, uh, project stems from an observation that's been made clinically that even in children where we know there, there was heavy prenatal alcohol exposure, um, there can be, in many cases, uh, little or no clinically important outcome. Uh, and that's compared to another child who has the same level of alcohol exposure but is severely affected. And what is, what, what is the basis for that? Uh, and that's where we've done to focus our attention on uh, genetic factors that may either predispose uh, a developing, uh, the developing fetus, the developing brain, to alcohol injury, or uh, render it more uh, resistant to, uh, to that same exposure. Um, and this is where the use of animal models, such as the mouse, are proving to be uh, very valuable. So go on to the next one. Uh, I think this more or less uh, is re reiterating that, that same point, um, that even uh, kids with high alcohol exposures can have little, uh, uh, little in the way of measurable injury. So that same, that same uh, characteristic, that same uh, phenomenon uh, occurs in animals as well, and particularly in, in mice. And what you're looking at is two different strains of mice. On the left, uh, a strain of mouse called the C57 black uh, because they have a, a characteristic black coat. And on the right is another uh, strain of mouse called the DBA2. What's interesting about these two lines is that if we were to examine the susceptibility of C57 black mice to ethanol, uh, that is the, uh, the, the pups, uh, if we give the pregnant mouse uh, ethanol and look at the, the pups, the offspring of C57 black mice are very, very susceptible to developmental injury from prenatal alcohol exposure. Yet the DBA uh, line of mice are incredibly resistant. They, they will show very little uh, injury, uh, at least comparatively, uh, to the C57 black at the same levels of, of alcohol exposure. So now we have these two uh, genetically different lines of animals that have very, very different phenotypes, uh, that is, their responsiveness to alcohol. And they have gen different genetic backgrounds as well. So we can use these now as a tool if we create crosses between two uh, genetically diverse uh, lines of mice. Uh, you can, and, and if this has been done, create a number of uh, genetically identical lines. So these are uh, uh, lines of animals that are crosses between these two parent strains, the C57 and the DBA. 
they have, uh, you can create these crosses that have ge different genetic backgrounds. And from that, we can now ask the question, are these animals or which of these uh, strains shows susceptibility to developmental uh, alcohol exposure and which are resistant? Uh, because they've been, they've, each of the lines has been genotyped, so we know their genetic makeup. Uh, now we need, need to find the phenotypic readout. So this uh, BXD line, it's a BXD family, it's, it's uh, a line of these inbred mouse strains created by crossing the C57 black and the DBA that are genetically defined, and now we want to understand their phenotypic response to alcohol. So we'll move on. Uh, okay. So here, <laughs> um, this is interesting. Well, Dan's a geneticist, so he was going to talk a whole lot about uh, uh, SNPs and how diverse uh, populations are. Uh, but we really are trying to model here these uh, w what exists in the human population. We're genetically diverse across uh, different populations, um, and uh, that genetic diversity. Uh, has a lot of influence on our responsiveness to alcohol. So uh, we'll go to the next slide, because I'm not a geneticist, so I'm not going to try to explain this. It's been, uh, so these are some of the facial phenotypes uh, that uh, occur. These are uh, some of the extreme examples of the, of the facial phenotypes that can occur in kids uh, as a consequence of prenatal alcohol exposure. What's interesting, though, is the, these same uh, very characteristic facial dysmorphologies that are used in the diagnosis of uh, particularly fetal alcohol syndrome can be recapitulated in their entirety in, uh, in embryonic mice. So the, uh, the thin lip, uh, the change in the, uh, the, the flattening of the nose, the uh, indistinct filtrum, the uh, uh, deficits in, in the eyes, all of these can be reproduced in animal models with prenatal alcohol exposure. That's just that's the only point to take from this. Next slide. This is just showing the same thing in, in details. Is that uh, a child with fetal alcohol syndrome shares uh, typical craniofacial features, including a smaller uh, smaller head, uh, the short palpebral fissures, uh, and, uh, and a thinning of the upper lip and the indistinct filter. So these, uh, again, it's just showing that we can uh, recreate the human situation in an animal model where we have much more control over uh, over the drug exposure. Next slide. What I should point out, these, these uh, sorry, these, those slides that uh, Dan showed, this is work from uh, Kathy Sulek's uh, lab at the uh, University of North Carolina. Uh, and, and Dr. Sulek has done some uh, incredibly uh, uh, powerful work in showing and, and demonstrating how uh, animal models can be used to recreate both the facial dysmorphology and the brain injury that characterizes FASD. What you're looking at here is a developing mouse embryo. Well, it, actually, it's a, a developing embryo. Uh, could be mouse, could actually be human. Uh, you know, at some point, we all look the same as. Uh, as cells divide and, and start to form. But the, the point is uh, here is just to identify areas of the uh, brainstem and uh, in particular where at, at the embryonic stage, uh, the developing neurons uh, that are starting to divide and differentiate are, are very vulnerable to chemical exposures, including alcohol. Uh, and some of these cells at, at these vulnerable stages will actually undergo cell death as a consequence of, uh, of alcohol exposure. We can measure cell death, and we can measure how, uh, uh, how alcohol has is, is impacted these uh, developing regions of the central nervous system, either the, the brainstem or the forebrain, in, uh, in embryonic mice with, with a high degree of, of sensitivity. And as Christian says, we can quantify uh, alcohol-induced cell death in, in the developing embryo uh, and then compare that quantitative measure of cell death across these different strains of animals. So this is just the workflow. Uh, timed pregnant mice uh, were, are administered either ethanol, uh, 
for uh, a maltose dextrin uh, just to uh, control for the caloric intake or are left untreated. And eight hours after those uh, exposures, uh, embryos can be harvested. You know, nine days of uh, pregnancy in the mouse, this is uh, towards uh, the end of the first trimester equivalent of pregnancy in, in the human. Um, and once those embryos are harvested, they're processed, uh, somites are, uh, are, are counted to uh, verify the timing of embryonic development. And then the embryo, uh, embryos are sectioned, uh, put on slides, and stained. Uh, and tunnel staining is, is a way of identifying or marking cells that are undergoing uh, cell death. And uh, so that you can measure or quantify this alcohol-induced cell death in the uh, nine-day-old mouse embryo. Next slide. And so here uh, you're looking at um, uh, a couple of reasons. This is a, a P57 black uh, mouse embryo. And the darkly stained uh, or, or uh, black uh, staining cells that you see, these are cells that are undergoing cell death as a consequence of alcohol exposure. Uh, so we're just quantifying now the number of these tunnel positive uh, cells which are uh, presumably undergoing cell death. Next. And yeah, so let's look at some of the uh, quantification. So the idea here, as I said, is to, is to do the same experiment, uh, the same uh, alcohol exposure uh, across multiple lines of these uh, genetically uh, defined animals, quantify the cell death, and then go back and taking the phenotypic information look for uh, genes that characterize the more susceptible lines versus uh, those that are resistant. And uh, you can see here across a number of, uh, of, of lines of animals that have been tested so far. Uh, if we just look at the, the left graph, this is the forebrain. So this is the developing forebrain in the embryo, which is going to give rise to structures like the cerebral cortex that uh, Kristen uh, so eloquently described as being uh, impacted by alcohol exposure in, in children. And we can see quantitatively across these different cell lines that there's differential sensitivity to that alcohol exposure during, during pregnancy, where some of the lines are showing uh, very high levels of, of cell death and some uh, very low levels, in fact, uh, uh, at levels that are not much different from the untreated control embryos. So our premise that there would be differential sensitivity across these lines uh, is, is, is bearing fruit, uh, that uh, we do see or can demonstrate differential vulnerability across the, these different uh, lines of animals. And once we have a, a sufficient number of these lines that are fully characterized, and the, and the target is to do 25 of these genetically diverse lines, and have the phenotypic readout of quantitative cell death in the developing embryo, can then go back and interrogate the genomes of those lines and identify the, the, the candidate genes for ethanol vulnerability. That would then be related to the information, the same types of information we're collecting in, uh, in the clinical population, where we, we genotyping uh, kids with an FASD and uh, typically developing controls uh, and we're looking, for, again, for candidate genes in, in those human populations. The, the mouse work, as, as, the, as for the rat model, will help us validate those candidate genes identified in the, in the uh, human population by finding their equivalents in, in the animal model, where, again, we have much more control over the uh, alcohol exposure. And I'm thinking that's the end of the presentation, Doug. Uh, little slides of, uh, of data here, so I'm not sure if you want to oh. present these or... There's this one mine, Oh, sorry, mine... Yeah, sorry, my, my screen just went dark. I guess it went to sleep on me. <laughs> uh, this, this is a way of... of uh, these are just uh, maps of uh, how this genetic analysis will be done. Um, and it's called quantitative trait loci. That is, finding uh, uh, loci within uh, individual uh, chromosomes that segregate with the specific phenotype. Uh, again, I'm not the geneticist, so uh, 
I'm not going to uh, try to explain that in any greater detail. And this is the last slide here. This is the last slide. Okay. <laughs> um, this is really interesting, and I'm assuming that Dan's trying to make associations between uh, gene networks and. Uh, uh, oh, this is from a publication. Okay. That uh, I can't really explain to you, so I'm not even going to try to explain this. <laughs> All I right. think it's linking associations between data sets. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're right, Joanne, but I'm just not sure what the point is he was trying to make. Yeah, okay. Me either. <laughs> All right. Well, that's uh, th thanks for uh, for pinch hitting uh, like that, James. On short notice, that couldn't possibly have been easy. But uh, it was great to have uh, some of that uh, that that ant more animal model information and really really helping us understand what what we know and how and sort of how much we actually know about about the injury and about uh, you know we can we can really match it up with animal models and human human models to this extent. It's really quite incredible to see that. Um, so there were there were a couple of questions that sort of came in just at the end of Joanne's presentation and uh, and into um, I think into Christian's pre presentation as well, but they were sort of looking for someone's looking for information about similarities I think between FASD and autism and if any of this work is applicable to the autism world. So for example, they were asking during Joanne's presentation about um, the stress levels uh, in. At the FASD population, would there be anything similar or any correlation between that and, and autism? And also, when looking at identifying the physical changes in uh, uh, in FASD in the brain, is is there anything similar in autism in, in the ability to identify autism in animal models or through imaging or anything like that? Uh, so I'll take a little bit uh, of that and then. Uh uh, as for Christian or Joanne, if they have any other thoughts, or Gail actually might have some thoughts on this as well. Uh, certainly some of the uh, behavioral presentation in, uh, in autism uh, overlaps with uh, phenotypes or, or uh, behavioral and, uh, language problems, for example, that occur in kids with FASD. So there are some similarities in the, the presentation. Uh, this is one of the strengths we're going to have in, uh, in NeuroDevNet. But actually, I could point out that um, we now recognize prenatal alcohol exposure as a risk factor, <clears throat> excuse me, a risk factor for, uh, for autism. Uh, so one of the uh, opportunities we have in NeuroDevNet, because we have such close collaboration across the, uh, the uh, disorder groups, is we can make some comparisons uh, uh, across across the data that we're, we're generating, looking for those uh, similarities. And uh, as I said, by, uh, by doing those comparisons across the disorders, uh, I think we'll learn much more about our, our, the individual disorders by our, our ability to compare and contrast. All right. Um, Gail, you had a comment okay. about the clinical relevance here. If you wanted to just jump in with that, I think it'd be great. We actually have, there have been some publications looking at administering the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, to children prenatally exposed to alcohol. Uh, this was done about uh, four years ago uh, by Summer Bishop and Kathy Lord. Kathy Lord is the one who developed the, the ADOS uh, out, uh, within our population. And there were some definite uh, similarities but there was also significant differences. And I think this, this work needs to be replicated again on a larger sample because uh, Summer Bishop, she actually used our population here at the Glen Rose who are actually pop the population participating in some of the NeuroDev network. But it was a small sample, so I think it needs a larger sample study. From a clinical perspective, we do see children coming through the prenatal exposed clinic where the, their presenting features are really on the autism spectrum from a, and we do actually go dual workup. We do all the uh, neuropsychological testing that we would for a, a prenatal exposure workup, and we'd also incorporate the ADOS. And then it's a clinical judgment at the end whether it is a dual diagnosis. And we have many children who do end up with a dual diagnosis. We're collecting that those right now, and again, because of our opportunities to be multi-site, I think this is another 
a project that we should be doing. It's called perspective taking that has been explored as a common deficit in both the alcohol exposed population and in children with autism. So I think there's definitely similar similarities that need further exploration. All right. Um, somebody's asking, what is the assessment used for the, a for the ASD population? And I think maybe we'll sort of limit the a autism questions here, as this is, uh, we're aiming at the FASD here, but we'll just, uh, we'll take this last question about autism, but uh, was that the uh, ADOS that you were uh, referring to maybe, Gail, that she's asking about? Uh, assessment for autism is a multidisciplinary team, just as is the assessment for an FASD diagnosis. Um, and Within both populations, we assess communication deficits, impairments. Within the autism population, we look more for restricted areas of interest, repetitive uh, motor mannerisms, uh, although we do see some of those uh, getting stuck within the FASD population. But the autism uh, diagnoses often incorporates the, standard, the gold standards for research, which is the ADOS. And then there is a, a gold standard questionnaire, the ADI, which is an interview of the parents getting the kind of over time how the child has changed in terms of social communication and, and learning development. But the, the ADOS is often looked at as, in terms of research, the gold standard. And then you do a checklist uh, on the symptoms you, from the multidisciplinary team using the DSM soon to be the DSM-5 criteria to see if the child meets the full criteria for an autism spectrum diagnosis. All right. All right, well, we have uh, come to the end of our time and even passed it a little bit. Uh, so, Gail, if you had any final comments uh, that you wanted to use to wrap this up, it would be great if you could go ahead with those. Uh, I, it's been very exciting learning so much through participation with NeuroDevNet, you know, we have definite proof that alcohol is a major risk factor for organic brain damage. And we've seen this in the animal model, Christian's demonstrating this in the neuroimaging studies. And then with our the functional group, we're able to look at what does this translate into? What are the functional impairments in children prenatal exposed to alcohol? Because at the end of the day, it's that pattern of strengths and weaknesses that are going to inform our intervention plan and as we're looking at developing better practices and interventions to be able to then evaluate the outcome, are the interventions effective by looking at the improvement in function over time? So I, I think it's really an excellent model of from lab to life and life to lab, as I mentioned before. And every time I think we do it, share our information, more research questions are generated. So if there's other researchers out there who want to join, I think there's going to be a lot of work ahead. All right. Thanks, Gail. And do any of our speakers, uh, before we sign off, have any final comments you would like to add before we close off? Uh, I guess I'll take that. I, I'd reiterate uh, uh, Gail's point. Uh, NeuroDevNet is always looking for new partners and uh, uh, people who are interested in uh, uh, research questions on neurodevelopmental disorders in general and uh, in our, for our perspective, FASD uh, specific, specifically. Uh, actually, in the near future, we will be looking for new ideas, new proposals coming forward uh, to go into the next iteration of, of NeuroDevNet. Uh, so uh, uh, we don't think we have all the great ideas. I'm sure there are other great ideas out there, and so we're, uh, we're open to those. All right, thanks, James, and thank, thanks to uh, Christian, Joanne, and uh, in his absence, Dan. It uh, would have been great to have Vaughn, but unfortunately that didn't work out. But great presentation, and thanks to all of you and to NeuroDevNet for, uh, for doing all this great work and for sharing it with our audience today. Um, just to let everyone know, uh, we do these webinars typically at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. Uh, there are, they are occasionally on times other than that, but uh, we're, we're, we're typically on a, on a Wednesday at 11 Eastern time schedule. Uh, you can always find more information on our Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can see here, and the recording for this presentation will be posted on this page uh, once it becomes available in the next couple of days. But if you're looking for more information, you can always go to the CAFC website uh, under the CAFC Presents section. Uh, 
Uh, we have all of the information about our webinars, including a calendar of upcoming events. Uh, it, for those uh, are folks interested in more FASD content, we do have uh, two more webinars coming up in the next month on our screening tools, one on the youth, uh, the tool for youth probation officers, uh, one on meconium screening, and a third one coming up uh, after March on uh, neuro, uh, the NST tool, uh, the neurobehavioral tool uh, as well. So uh, check the website for more information about those and be sure to register, pass uh, the information along to your colleagues, and hopefully we will see all of you on the upcoming webinars. Thank you again.